Hi, welcome to the noise path. In this episode, we're going to try and see if we can get this Stanford Research Model SR830 DSP lock-in amplifier up and running. There shouldn't be too much wrong with it, but we'll see once we turn it on. Now, I actually have two videos on lock-in amplifiers, and you can do some pretty interesting stuff with it, and I cover the theory of how they work and how they're built in details. The other two that I've repaired are different models than this one, so it's going to be unique in this situation. But we've done things like measuring the speed of sound and measuring extremely small responsivity from some photo detectors. These are very unusual experiments that we can do with lock-in amplifiers, and there's, of course, a whole world of stuff that can be done. So definitely go and check them out. Now this one is uh, supposed to be actually mostly working. Let's go and turn it on and see what we get. It's already plugged in. All right, let's see. Okay, so that's so far so good. Ah, that was a fail. That was a battery test that failed. Program, DSP pass, um, standard mode, okay. Well, it did boot up, so it seems like it had very minor issues. It didn't like the battery, so we have to check and see what's going on with the battery, but the rest seems okay. Now, unfortunately, with lock-in amplifiers, it's hard to know if they're working just by looking at them. You have to set it up in some experiment to make sure that they're functional, as they have a lot of gain, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong with them internally. But we should be able to do at least a couple of things. Now, there's also a knob missing from it, so we have to find... Uh, the knob not, not, does seem to be working. You have to find something to replace it with. But every time, of course, I turn it on and off because the battery is failing, it's going to reset to all default status. Let's go and take a look inside and see where the battery is. So here's the back of the unit. All the mixed signal analog stuff is in the front covered already. But the back has the power supply section, of course, transformer. It has all the rectification, the fan is over here. And it does have the main processor as well as the EEPROM and a couple of digital things that control the main unit over there. So I was looking for the battery. And check this out. Well, that's where the battery is supposed to be, so the battery is not in there. It looks like someone must have removed the battery and just never replaced it. Probably maybe it was leaking or it had already completely run out. Remember, this unit is from the mid-90s, so it's been a long time, and that's probably why the battery is gone. So let's go ahead and replace that with something. It's a little bit hard to put it in there, so I may just take a regular battery and put it on some wires and you know, mount it on the side over here. Okay, so I went ahead and made this, nothing more than just a little lithium battery, and I think it's the same size, same, same form factor that used to be there. These are non-rechargeable, and we're just going to solder it into there and then mount it on the side, and that way it's easier to replace in the future. We don't have to try and squeeze a battery in that tight space over there. All right, here's our quick replacement, just wired into the same terminal. There's really nothing unusual, but this should fix it. All right, let's give it a try. I also found a replacement up from another old instrument. We can power this on now. All right, there it is, battery pass. Okay, good. Let's see what happens when we put it in some kind of a loop now. Okay, so the very first thing to try is to make sure the PLL of the SR830 is actually working. So it has its own internal reference. Right now it's set to one kilohertz, but if you inject an external reference into it and select the external reference, it will use its own internal one as a frequency counter. So it should tell you what frequency you're injecting. That essentially tests the entire PLL for most parts. There may be some, still some unchecked things. So let's put this source to the external. So now it says unlock because it's not connected. Let's use the Stanford Research DS345 to test it. This has a really good time base. I repaired this in a previous video, actually quite a long time ago. Let's plug that over here. Let's put that into reference out. There we go. I think the unlock went away, and we are essentially at the same value. So there's a tiny difference between the internal reference of this one. The internal reference of this one is quite a bit better. So let's go ahead and change the frequency. Now, this should be able to lock this up to 100 kilohertz. So let's try that. Uh, going up with this, I think. Here's 2. Yeah, no problem. Here's 10. No worries. That still works. Let's enter 50 kilohertz. There it is. 50 kilohertz works. So 100 kilohertz. That also works. So here's 101, here's 102. So this is now the specification. So above that, it's still working, but at some point, yeah, there it is. You can see it still no longer works. It just was showing unlock for a second. So it's going to get confused at some point, but it works up to 100 kilohertz. I would also like to measure the amplitude accuracy of this to make sure that the output of the synthesizer is the correct voltage levels. So this is all in RMS. So this should be putting out 1 volt RMS, and I'm going to test that using this HP 3400B, which I modified with an LCD screen, which digitizes everything that's displayed using the analog meter over here, and all of that is in a separate video showing the PCBs that was added to this and how it was all done. You can go ahead and watch that. So right now we're on a very large scale, so of course we see nothing. Let's go down to 3 volt RMS, and see how accurate this is. 
Now, of course, we're looking at the RMS voltage here. The rest are in 50 ohms. This is not a 50 ohm system right now. And look at that. That is pretty good. That's pretty good for something from the mid 90s. It's really quite accurate. Let's go to one volt now. It should be full scale almost here. There you go. Yeah, there it is. It is essentially full scale. So I think it's working really well. Let's see if it can hit its maximum. Let's see what is this maximum. Five is this maximum. Five volt RMS. So we should be able to put it here. It should be half scale here. There we go. Let's see if it stabilizes. That is pretty good. 5.0. 5.00 it's gonna yeah it's pretty stable there there you go that is that is really good let's look at this absolute minimum there you go you should be able to do four millivolt rms so i can go all the way to here even i should be able to measure four millivolt rms let's see if it's accurate here too very good look at that 4.0 well 4.00 almost that's really great for something again that is this old is pretty impressive Let's see if there's anything else you want to do. Just do 10 full scale here just to make sure. Excellent. Yeah, it works very well. So I'm fairly confident that most of the things, at least on the generator side, are functional. So here's an experiment that I think you might enjoy. So at the bottom is the SR830, of course, the docking amplifier. And at the top, we have the Tektronics 4 series mixing on the oscilloscope, which has the digital down converter and some pretty sophisticated things it can display in the frequency and the time domain at the same time. You can display phase versus time, frequency, and so on. I've done full reviews on all of these things. You should definitely check it out. These are really great oscilloscopes. So we have the signal coming out of this and it loops around into some DUT here. I'll share that too. And it comes back into the lock-in amplifiers. And we're simultaneously looking at that signal here on the oscilloscope as well. Obviously there's a sinusoid there, which is the signal coming out. It's at 10 kilohertz, so very low frequency, but it doesn't of course matter in this case. And the amplitude is half a volt RMS. Now we're also measuring that. You can see that we're almost at half a volt RMS, so it's almost a one-to-one -one signal going back in. Everything is locked and stable. So we can look at the circuit and see what it is and see the consequences of that first on the oscilloscope and the difference of what we can observe here on the lock-in amplifier. So the circuit we have is really simple. It's a pair of anti-parallel diodes and they're connected backwards. So here's one of them, here's the other one. These diodes are essentially identical. The signal from the lock and amplifier comes in, it goes right through the breadboard and comes out from the other side. So if I remove all of this, it's essentially a through between this point and that point. This switch puts this diode in parallel to the input and this switch puts this diode in parallel to the input. So I can individually turn these switches on and off and actually add or remove a diode from the circuit. So if both of these circuits are on at the same time, you're going to have the two diodes back to back in parallel with the line. Now the output driver of the lock-in amplifier has a 50 ohm resistor at its output. So essentially we have a resistor and a diode that goes to ground. So we have basically a resistor driving a diode. We can either drive a diode one way, the other way, or simultaneously at the same time. So what are the consequences of this? Well, a diode in large signal is going to show some nonlinearity. So if I turn this diode on, I'm going to clip the waveform at the top side of it, at the positive swing. If I put this one, I'm going to clip it on the negative side. And if I turn them both on, I'm going to clip it simultaneously at the top and at the bottom. Now the difference on that in the time domain should be pretty obvious. Everybody can imagine what that looks like. And even the frequency domain is fairly easy to imagine. Okay, so here we go. So here's our 10 kilo signal and here's the spectrum of that signal. Right now both diodes are turned off. So you can see we have a very strong fundamental signal at 10 kilohertz, which is to be expected. We have a tiny bit of residual of the second harmonic, we have a third harmonic, and we have the fourth harmonic. This is at 40 kilohertz. We're looking from DC all the way to 50 kilohertz, which is a very low frequency of course. So there is some residual harmonics, but those harmonics are actually primarily coming from the oscilloscope's front end itself. Now even if I were to change the front end, and just change the vertical scaling, you can see I can introduce quite a bit more harmonic. Now this is not a lot of nonlinearity, but it is a lot for what we want to measure. If you just want to measure the diode's nonlinearity, just changing the vertical scale of the oscilloscope can have a negative impact on that in order to fill the screen. Remember the diodes are not even there. This is residual measurement from the oscilloscope. And I know that it is not from the uh, Stanford Research Unit because if I change this scale back down, you can see that the spectrum changes quite a bit. And this is, of course, computed on what is measured. So it's the front end of the oscilloscope. But that's okay. That's you know, relatively normal. And there are some spurious tones from mixing terms because of the oscilloscope's DDC. The fact that it can do this at this low frequency is already pretty interesting. Okay, so I'm going to turn one diode on. Now, the nonlinearity of the diode is really subtle because I'm only putting in half a volt RMS. So the diode is barely being forward biased. I'm going to turn one of them on. As soon as I turn it on, 
can see that the second harmonic gets quite a bit stronger. So let me go back so you can actually see the difference a little bit better. Okay, so here's the diode off. We can see very little second harmonic right there. We can turn one of the diodes on and we can see quite a bit more. And you can also see the third harmonic and the fourth harmonic. Now you barely see any difference in the time domain, if anything at all. That's because, again, this is a really weak compression of those diodes. Let me increase the amplitude of the signal a little bit so that we can exaggerate this. It's a little bit easier to see. So we are right now at one volt. Now you can clearly see the clipping, right? So if I turn the diode off, the clipping goes away. Turn it back on, clipping goes on. Now if I turn the other diode on, you can see the bottom clips. If I bo turn both of them on, both of them clip, okay? But I don't want to saturate it so much. I want to have a very subtle amount, very tiny amount of nonlinearity. So let's go back to half a volt RMS again. So we can get into the situation where the nonlinearity is really, really small. Okay, so here's half a volt. Now I'm going to turn the first one on. So we can see we get our second harmonic, third and fourth. Now I'm going to turn the second one on. And as soon as I do that, we have now a symmetric clipping. And look what happens to the second harmonic. Okay, it almost completely disappears again. And that's to be expected because you have the two in opposite phases and they cancel each other. All the even more harmonics now disappear. This is becoming more and more like a square wave and square wave, of course, doesn't have second order harmonics, only has the odd uh, order harmonics. It doesn't have any even ones. So this is normal. If I turn one off again, you can see the second, the fourth comes back, turn back again, it goes down. Now, you can actually plot the phase of any of these frequencies across time using this oscilloscope, but that's a unique situation. This is a property of the Tektronics. If you're using a regular oscilloscope, you cannot do this. So we get spoiled a little bit with the software of the Tech 4, 5, and 6 series, but I want to do this experiment on now the at Stanford Research because it's going to give you some other interesting pieces of information. Let's go ahead and turn both of these diodes uh, off again. Yeah, so they're both off. You can see all the nonlinearity goes away. Turn them both on again. Only the third one comes back. That's to be expected. Okay, so both of them are off again. Now let's look at the lock-in amplifier. Okay, so here we are. We're still looking at 10 kilohertz and half a volt, of course, and we're looking at the first harmonic. So what this is reporting to us, I have configured it to basically give us the vector result. So it's giving us the magnitude and the phase of the first harmonic of that signal once it goes through the DUT and back to the input. Now the magnitude is essentially the same as what we are sending. This is almost the same amplitude. And that's because the diodes are first of all both turned off and majority of the signal is still in the fundamental frequency, of course. Now, the, in terms of phase, we're looking at only 0.03 degrees of deviation. At 10 kilohertz, there isn't really much of a delay here, so it doesn't, we don't really have to worry about it. But what about the second harmonic? If I go to the second harmonic, as soon as I do that, you can see that this voltage is going to drop essentially to zero because both of those diodes are not turned off. Now, we need to expand the sensitivity of this instrument in order to be able to see the tiny amount of residual harmonic there. So I'm going to expand by a factor of 100, which is quite large. Now you can see that there is 0 0.028 millivolt divided by 100, and the phase of that signal is about 34 or 35 degrees. This is the residual leftover second harmonic in the entire system, and there are multiple reasons why it is there. Most of it is most likely coming from here. But what happens if I turn one of the diodes on? Well, as soon as I do that, I expect to see a lot of second order power again, and it should show up right here. I'm going to turn the diode on, and look at what happens. Remember this, you have to divide this number by a factor of 100, okay? There you go. So we have two, about 2 millivolt divided by 100, and the phase of it is 94 degrees. Now, it should be 90, and that extra 4 degrees is there for a reason. I'm going to let you think about this and discuss it in the comment section of why that is. So that's one of the diodes. So you can see that we indeed have a lot, some, a lot more second harmonic because one of the diodes is in there. I'm going to turn the diode back off. If I do that, of course, it's going to stabilize to back exactly where it used to be. And I'm going to turn the other diode on. Now look what happens to the other diode. And these diodes are essentially identical, so the amount of nonlinearity it gives you is exactly the same. But look at the phase. It's now exactly the opposite phase. It should be minus 90. Again, it's minus 84, so there's a couple of degrees additionally there for the same reason. Now, when I turn both of them on, they should cancel each other again. And let's try that. Okay, I'm going to turn the other one as well. And you can see that the second harmonic again goes way, way down. We're going to let it stabilize there. You can see that it goes to be very, very low. Okay? So it's still a little bit residual left. Now, where is that residue coming from? Well, it's coming from the fact that these diodes aren't exactly identical, and they cannot completely cancel each other out. You have a massive dynamic range here, which you do not have on the oscilloscope. Let's look at the third harmonic now. Here's the third harmonic. Now, the third harmonic is going to be quite large, relatively speaking, because both diodes are on and the power in the third harmonic goes up. Now, if I turn both diodes off, the power in the third harmonic 
also it's going to drop of course to almost nothing it's going to disappear almost completely whatever residual left is going to be the same reason as a second harmonic I'm going to turn them both on okay there you go so I'm going to go back to the second harmonic again I'm going to wait for this to stabilize I can change the time constant over here okay I'm going to wait for it to stabilize now I'm just going to touch one of the diodes now as soon as I touch one of the diodes I'm going to heat it up with respect to the other one which means that the forward bias voltage of the diode is going to shift ever so slightly by the delta temperature that it experiences that is a symmetry is a mismatch it's going to add to the mismatch of those two diodes I'm just going to touch it and look at the phase and look at the amplitude soon as I touch it there's a massive difference that difference is extremely difficult to catch with an oscilloscope in fact you don't see it at all this is buried in the noise but this can because it's a lock and amplifier it can go even below noise depending on how much time constant you put on it I'm gonna put my finger on the other one you can see that the phase now flips in favor of the other one look at that okay isn't it amazing they let go it's going to slowly cool down and slowly recover to where it used to be and touch this one back again and I shift it to the other side. This is a, an incredible measurement. Hopefully you can appreciate how sensitive this instrument is and what unusual things you can do. So you can characterize the temperature difference between them or the semiconductor differences between them. You can measure very, very small changes in temperature by using a lock and amplifier and these two diodes in two different places in your system and catch very, very small changes. You can even measure how long it takes for something to heat up. The this uh, diffusion of heat across these two tiles can be measured by the rate of change of this phase. So there's a lot of fancy things you can do. But of course, I've done more experiments using lock and amplifiers that I definitely recommend that you go and see. But I did want to give you a little bit more taste of this. And just to prove to you that touching it makes almost no difference on the second harmonic, looking there, see if I put my finger on it, you see nothing. Whereas, of course, the lock and amplifier goes crazy. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick video. Again, as always, thanks to the Patreon supporters who make these things possible, allowing me to make more of these noise path quick videos to show you cool things around the lab. Let me know what you think about this, and I'll see you in the comment section. Boom.